All right, I guess we can get started. So thank you all for joining in um, for this talk on Apache Ozone State of the Union um, about around the lunchtime. So I hope you do enjoy this talk. Um, and uh, with me is my colleague, uh, um, staff engineer at Cloudera, is Arvindan Vijayan. He works very closely on the Ozone team. So a bit about us. Uh, I mean, both of us, we work for Cloudera. Both of us are heavily involved with um, some of the key Apache uh, projects um, as, an, as a committer, as a PMC. And our contact details are listed here. You can uh, contact us uh, even after the talk if you have any queries. So here's the agenda. We will basically take a quick walkthrough in the history of Ozone and a brief overview of Ozone on what Ozone is. Uh, we'll talk about the current status of the project and then we'll uh, dive a little bit uh, deeper into the highlights and what's the roadmap and you know the upcoming features in ozone so uh, for the history and overview of ozone right we we've all used hdfs for a good amount of time and um, obviously hdfs is a very um, old technology now uh, and it was designed to meet a specific use case but as the usage progressed, the use cases also evolved. And um, we started to hit the scalability limits of HDFS, right? So a, a few years back, you know, a lot of um, improvements were suggested uh, at an architectural level uh, from the community people. But then um, HDFS was used pretty much worldwide and uh, it was very hard to go and change a fundamental piece in HDFS. So that is how the idea of a separate subproject under HDFS was born, and Ozone actually started as a subproject under the Hadoop trunk. So that's how it all kick started. And uh, you know, fast forward four alpha releases, one beta release uh, last year, um, Ozone moved as a separate top level project uh, by itself, uh, and that's where it's called Apache Ozone. So what is Apache Ozone? It's a raft based scalable object store. And um, the key difference from name node being uh, it has a decoupled namespace and block space. So metadata is stored in high performance rocks DB instances. Uh, thus, there's a heavy reliance on the off heap memory instead of keeping the entire metadata in the heap memory. And security is built in by default. Uh, as we will go along in this talk, you'll listen more about uh, security features. And in fact, there's a dedicated talk on Ozone security uh, later today. Uh, it's obviously built by some of the seasoned experts who've contributed heavily on the Apache Hadoop community. So the strengths of HDFS are obviously retained and we've tried to address the limitations uh, of HDFS in this Apache Ozone project. Uh, quickly diving over to the building blocks of Ozone, right? As I mentioned, Ozone will separate the namespace management and the block space management. Uh, namespace managed by the Ozone Manager daemon, right? and it obviously keeps only the working set in the memory. The block space is managed by storage container manager. And let me uh, warn you, this container is not our traditional Linux container. Um, this is an abstract concept in Ozone. Uh, it, it's not same as the Linux container or the YARN containers for that matter, right? So it scales by not tracking the individual data blocks. So basically what it does is, it, it tries to track the containers, right? And those containers will aggregate all the blocks that are there um, in that container. So that is how it limits the size of the block report and all that and, and makes the management of that block space a bit easier. And since the namespace and the block space are segregated, uh, you can basically scale independently whichever layer you want you know depending on what kind of use cases you have uh, so ozone can today scale to billion files in a cluster and that is you know i think at least about 10x of what hdfs can uh, achieve so diving down a little bit about the raft consensus protocol that we are using in ozone right so you you may have heard of Paxos, so Raft is just another consensus protocol, right? On how it can achieve the consensus in the whole right path um, of the ozone system. So to do that, um, you know, we we did explore a lot of solutions and eventually thought that it would be better if we write our own solution for the Raft consensus. So that gave birth to the Apache Ratis project, 
um, uh, you know, which is our own uh, Java-based implementation of the Raft consensus protocol. Uh, basically, you know, you have the state machine and uh, you know the standard draft basically will ask for the leader election will ask for the vals uh, replication snapshots lock com compactions and so on and so forth in addition um, you know the apache ratis project that we created we realized that uh, it would be handy if we could make it uh, you know have a plug and play approach so it provides the pluggable log a state machine and the rpc layer implementations so that you don't necessarily are restricted to using it with ozone so if in future you need an application uh, where you have a consensus requirement and you want to use a raft protocol uh, you could very well try to use apache ratis with very minimal adjustments so every ozone component uh, uses ratis to maintain uh, you know the same interest and to maintain the same consistency and consensus right so I, I won't dive much into the detail because we've had a lot of talks on Ratis and uh, we'll have Arvind and talk a lot about the next steps because there's a lot of details that Arvind will focus on and he will definitely focus a lot about some of the key features and the highlights made especially around the file systems and the performance and how the insight is um, going to play a role here. So I'll continue sharing the slides, Arvind, and you can um, start talking sure so uh, this is like a deployment level architecture view of ozone as you can see here it has a lot of components so i'm going to try and concentrate on one by one so the starting with the ozone manager which is the namespace component so which maintains the mapping between the different keys or objects or files that you create to the different containers that they belong to the container itself, as uh, Dinesh mentioned, is like an abstraction or a group of blocks that are put together that are uniquely addressable inside the ozone world. Uh, so, uh, the SCM or the storage container manager is the block space manager. It is responsible for doing node management, you know, ha -ha, get, getting heartbeats from the various ozone data nodes. It makes sure that the containers are replicated in, in, a, in a correct manner if, if with respect to topology, with respect to the number of replicas. It also makes sure that when you have like a, a delete command going through into the system, it, it does an async deletion process by uh, kind of uh, handshaking with the data node. Uh, apart from these two major master demons, we have uh, the ozone data node. This is where the data resides in terms of uh, there's a spe special way in which ozone lays out the on disk structures of maintaining the various files, the actual block files that are created on disk, as well as the metadata that is used to uh, refer to these block files. Uh, as said earlier, all these three components, the OM, the SCM, and the data nodes, have their own RocksDB, uh, which is which they manage. In the case of the OM, there is just one RocksDB. The SCM also has one. But the data node has a RocksDB instance per container that it manages. So each of them tries to keep that in sync across a quorum of nodes that they are forming a ring towards. So. Uh, on the client side of things, we have the S3 gateway. So the S3 gateway is a stateless REST-based web service, which is responsible for converting an S3-based API into a protocol which Ozone Manager understands. So it's basically, uh, it converts HTTP into an RPC, uh, RPC mechanism, which is understood by Ozone Manager. So when you talk to the S3 gateway, you would expect to talk to uh, using regular S3 clients like Boto3, or AWS S3 API or any S3 based uh, command that you S3 based job that you're already running. And then uh, it is going to use the access ID and secret key based authentication and it's going to uh, convert it into a you know, token which is understood by the Ozone Manager. And the Ozone Manager uh, understand which is the actual user who's making the request and does the authentication and authorization accordingly. On the other uh, uh, fronts, we have Recon. Recon is also a, like a master service, but it is not at the core write and read part. It is more like a listener component, which sits on the sidelines and gets data from OM, SCM, as well as the data nodes through heartbeats. And it tries to understand the state of the cluster in terms of namespace summaries, uh, the container summaries, uh, the node management summaries, and whether uh, there is some missing data in the cluster in terms of replication, or are there under-replicated containers, metrics and all the other things which are outside the core data read and write path are meant to be part of recon. Since uh, 
the ozone is a multi protocols has multi protocol support s3 as well as native object store as well as a, a hadoop compatible file system it can also work against something like the httpfs so it, since it provides a hadoop compatible file system so you have all these uh, analytical uh, analytic applications or tools that you can or engines that can actually work against ozone seamlessly for example spark hive impala yarn all that will just work against ozone if configured to talk to an ofs endpoint the ofs stands for the ozone file system here so dinesh can you move to the next slide okay so so i'm going to zero in on just the metadata layout now so this metadata layout is how the ozone manager lays out when you try to create a key against it so if you look at a, a, a sample key or a file that you create on ozone it will look something like on the right hand pane so you have a volume a bucket uh, like a prefix and then eventually the name of the object that you want to create so you if you want to divide these into uh, individual entities you start with the volume so the volume is similar to a user account you might have a volume for engineering you want to have a volume for marketing you want to have a volume for uh, maybe a hdfs based replication where you want to bring in one hdfs cluster to one ozone volume so you that is where you would want to control your authorization piece buckets are similar to amazon s3 bucket so bucket is one level of indirection within the volume and you can buckets can have keys inside it but you cannot have nested buckets so uh, so now the question might arise that if there is a volume on top of a bucket how does s3 based access work so that is where we have a special uh, volume which is called the s3v so any access that you do using the s3 protocol using the s3 gateway will be mapped to the s3v volume and uh, all that is abstracted out from the from the client itself so keys are similar to files or objects that you would associate with blocks and those form the uh, the leaf most level of the path that you created so it, it, uh, depending on how ozone has been configured whether you want to use it as a file system or you want to use it as an object store the intermediate prefixes in that path to the key are created or not for example if it's a pure object store we don't expect to create the app one and the instance one as sub directories in in the metadata tables but if it if ozone is uh, it's like a more like an ofs based system or like a file system uh, supporting uh, use case that you have then you would want to uh, then you want to configure it in such a way that the app one and the instance one also are created as sub directories so that it allows you to do ls like operations uh, can you go to the next slide dinesh okay so uh, i'm going to give a snapshot of features that were released as part of the 110 release which is more than 6 months back and then we are going to drill down on some of the features which uh, which are close to release in the 120 we are quickly wrapping up the 120 release and it should be out in let's say in the next 2 weeks so with respect to 110 uh, broadly we have support you know in multiple ways like you know native object store ozone has its own shell based access you could quickly write a library where you use the ozone classes directly to talk to ozone or you can use s3 uh, any well known s3 based cli or client out there and then hcfs is the hadoop compatible file system in this case it is called the ofs scheme similar to an s3a or uh, adls or just hdfs as well uh, we have fully baked security i'm not going to go into very much detail here because we have a dedicated talk for that so since uh, we use the hadoop rpc library so kerberos and delegation token works we also have the block token to talk between the client and the data node we have uh, uh, tde support using hadoop and uh, ranger kms of course we have s3 based security in case that is your cup of tea so you want to use access id and secret key you can use the s3 based uh, authentication to talk to ozone we have gdpr support and audit logging for all the demons inside the cluster since we have a hcfs we are uh, fully compatible with yarn hive spark impala nine five so there is nothing that needs to be done other than making sure that the ozone client jar is present in the class path so if you configure an ofs scheme to talk to your with your your, your existing applications to point to an ozone like a path including the volume you are going to uh, things will work seamlessly on the namespace side uh, we have high availability of ozone manager again through a rattus quorum based concept we have quota support on the volume and the bucket level the authorizer support we have two kinds of authorizer you have you can use the ozone's native authorizer or you can use the ranger authorizer 
but those are exclusive. You can use either the first one or the second one, but uh, unlike HTFS, you cannot have a combination of both. Uh, and then there's an interesting feature, which is called like a bucket link, where you could create a bucket which is outside the S3V volume or any volume for that matter, but you could kind of uh, mount it under the uh, S3 volume so that you can access it using the S3 protocol. So that is uh, more like a usability feature there. On the data side, data man management side, we have node decommissioning, maintenance mode, we have block lo locality, we have a network topology similar to HDFS. We also have an integrity scanner, which, is, which can be enabled, which routinely scans all the containers on the data nodes to make sure that there are no failures or there are no like corruptions on the data level or at the, at the metadata level. We also have a fault injection library, which is written in C++, which, which allows us to test against uh, problems that are outside the control of the own world, which is underlying the disk or on the IO path. If there is some error, this kind of framework allows us to simulate those failures. On the usability, troubleshooting, and monitoring front, we have Recon, which has a very intuitive UI to understand the state of the cluster in terms of whatever uh, dimension that you want to see it. If you want to look at uh, how your namespace is organized, you, you can there is a tab to do that. There is If you want to look at how the data nodes are heart beating, if you have a stale data node, dead data node, you have like a tab to do that. And similarly for containers and some other diagnostic information. There is also, other than Recon itself, there is also a rich set of CLI-based uh, interfaces that provide a lot of uh, in-depth analysis into the ozone working and uh, understand how the RocksDB itself is used to store these uh, individual keys and files. Yeah, Dinesh, we can move on. Yeah, okay. um, just one second, Arun. Um, yeah, I just wanted to pitch in about the community side of thing before we dive further into the features, right? So it has been, uh, Ozone has been generally available since uh, the release 1.0, uh, September 2020. Our latest table release is 1.1.0 and our next upcoming release is 1.2.0. And uh, we have about 27 PMC members uh, 51 committers uh, spanning from different organizations like uh, Cloudera, Target, Tencent, Infinstore, Oracle, Microsoft, Intel, and many more. And our PMC chair is uh, Sami Chen from Tencent, whom you might know uh, with her work with uh, HDFS, Park, and some of the other Apache projects. And um, we are thankful and we are lucky that our committers in PMC are located in a broad set of uh, locations right from US to Hungary, India, China, Germany, and many other countries. Um, yeah, Arvind, then you can continue. Yeah, sure, uh, thanks, Dinesh. So uh, now that we have seen uh, a snapshot of what Ozone uh, can provide in 110, I wanted to drill down a little bit deeper in what was built in the last six months uh, in terms of you know large features and uh, things that have like significant changes in the way Ozone works. So the first one I want to start with is uh, HGDS 2939, which is the Ozone file system optimizations, or you can also call it prefix optimization. So before we go into that, uh, just a refresher on how uh, uh, these big data applications like uh, Hive, Impala, they, they work against Hadoop is, uh, they create like, uh, they do a lot of deletes and renames when you do some operation on the table level. Let's say you want to uh, drop a table or you want to move data from one table to another, or you want to do a big DCP. Uh, these daemons usually create a temporary location in the target file system and then at the uh, during the execution execution phase and at the commit phase they do an atomic rename of that directory to the intended uh, results so let's say you want to run something like teragen or something like that it creates all these different numbers in these temp directories and at the last step the commit phase it's going to move it into a uh, the results directory that you that you want so to support that uh, uh, in in a in a system like ozone uh, let's see how the uh, file system or how the namespace entity is actually laid out right now so i'm going to call this uh, the om metadata format as the type uh, in which the namespace entities are laid out here it's called a key table 
so you might be confused what is a table doing here so the table is nothing but a column family in rocks db that we use so each of these demons when they use rocks db they create different tables or column families and they write specific subsection of the data into that so the key table is the uh, eventual table where you put in the leaf elements along with the directories uh, and which eventually have the leaf elements of the, the files will actually point to the containers of the blocks there so if you look at the first uh, picture there so the key table contains the individual directories which and the and at the every prefix level so for example it has the directory one and then the one uh, followed by two and then all the way up to three and the final file also has the full prefix to that so in case let's say i want to rename a directory which is directory one so to do this in ozone it is not an atomic operation not only i ha i have to change the first entry there I have to change every entry below that because all of these has a references to directory one. If I do not do that, then all those will become dangling references, which I cannot access after that. So this is going to be a big problem in use cases like Hive and Impala, which is going to do like an atomic rename at the last step or an atomic delete. So deletes will work the same way. If I have to do a delete at directory one, there is no way it can be atomic because I have to go and delete individual elements. So that is why we, we came up with a concept which is called a prefix optimization, where the, the way in which these entries are stored inside the tables are completely different. So now every prefix is associated with an object ID, and the object ID is the one which is part of the key entry. So a new set of tables were created. This is time is called the directory table and the file table, so that you don't really mix with the old tables. And uh, you can, and the way these entries are stored here is you uh, for every entity starting with the volume you are associated with an object id and the object id is part of the prefix for all the child entries after that so for the same example that is shown here so fi uh, so 512 can correspond to the object id of the bucket so the, and 1024 is the object id of directory 1 so if you look at the next entry after that it's 1024 slash directory 2 and which has its own object id and so on so in this case, if I want to change or rename that just that directory one, I don't need to worry about all the child entry. I just need to worry about that one entry whose key needs to be changed to whatever the new value is. And then this can be like just a, like a one remove and one put operation, which can be atomic compass compared to going down the entire tree path in, in the first example. As of uh, one, two, zero, uh, this is like a OM level uh, layout that you have to set. So you can either have uh, OM talking the, <clears throat> the old way of uh, doing things where it creates these full paths inside the key table, or you could have uh, o <coughs> OM do the, the second part where it creates these individual uh, uh, directories as IDs. Uh, but we are making some changes to make it at, uh, at a different granularity level. We will talk about that. So can, can you go to the next slide? So let's see how this impacts uh, something like a drop uh, table query from Hive. So let's, uh, we tested it out with about, around 5,000 rows. And HGFS is still very fast. So we see that since it provides atomic uh, renames and atomic deletes, it, it's going to finish slightly over half a second to delete that table or to drop that table. So the ozone with the object store layout or the legacy layout took about 12 seconds to do the same thing versus the FSO layout, which is a new one, which takes less than a second. So that's about 10 to 15 X improvement on the drop table query. Of course, nothing comes for free. So when you're going to save some time on doing some operations like this, there's also the added penalty on the right path. There's a little bit of right amplification because you have to go and manage these IDs and you have to create these individual paths with IDs wherever, whenever somebody wants to create new data. So at that time, we, we are looking at something around 5% penalty on the right path. Uh, and uh, we are still working to make this a little bit better because 5% is still very much manageable. And we are looking at caching all the directory entries. We are trying to see if there's a way we could do this better. So uh, there's more information on the, this exact feature because it was given as a talk in the last Apache Con. I've added the link here. So feel free to take a look. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, so uh, although the picture in the architectural view had SCM in multiple instances, in 110, we did not have SCM HA. So SCM HA is available from 120. 
and uh, the SEMHA is very similar to OMHA. So, it, uh, so the name node has a concept of an active passive kind of HA mechanism where if one node goes down, the other one starts to become the active name node and it becomes the source of growth. But in the case of uh, uh, the ozone ecosystem, the HAs are managed using ratus. So you have more like odd number of instances of that same demon and you still have that one leader and the rest of the nodes are followers and you expect any mutations of state to go through the uh, ratus quorum. So, uh, uh, in the case of the SCM itself, the Rattus state machine is the ROXDB. Uh, to more, put it more specifically, it's a subsection of tables within the ROXDB, which is meant to be updated using the replicated state, replicated state change. We will go to, into that. So, of course, when you, it, it's easier to make OMHA in some fashion because it's not talking to the data nodes, but the SCM has data nodes reporting to it. And when this concept of leadership changes and you know pipeline quorums and all that, so it becomes a little bit more challenging. So there was a decision taken to have uh, data nodes heartbeat to all the SCMs, but they will process the commands only from the current leader SCM. So that was achieved through uh, figuring out what is the exact term. The term is a raft concept. So you put in the term at every command that the SCM sends down to the data node and the data node always makes sure that it honors only the highest term that it has seen. So even if there's an old leader which comes back and tries to do something with the data node, th those commands are going to be rejected until that uh, the SCM kind of knows that it is no longer the leader. So uh, it's very similar to, it's, it's, it's not a problem outside the con uh, concept of the raft protocol. It is a very similar problem where there is just one state machine and it's trying to, uh, it's, it, the leader starts with the mutation and tries to mutated uh, across the followers. So uh, one thing is uh, not all the RocksDB entities are uh, changed through uh, the, the RAF pipeline. Uh, node states do not really go through the replicated mechanism because those are just heart beating uh, information. So uh, the nodes already heart beat to these different SCMs anyway. So all the SCMs can maintain what they think is the last state of the node. So it's, it's at node level, it's not at the container or at the pipeline level. So, uh, but any operation like you want to create a container, you want to, let's say that you want to create a key inside ozone. So the, the key inside ozone is going to go to the ozone manager. The ozone manager is going to say, oh, I need a block. And the block is going to be requested to the SCM from the ozone manager. And at that time, it's a database mutation because it has to see if there's an existing container which can accommodate that request or it has to create a new container to do that. So all these classify as you know state changes, and these state changes will have to go through this replication. Uh, we can go to the next slide. OK, so this is a snapshot of what is the replicated state within the SCM. So if you look at what are the things that go through RATIS and, uh, and the node states, which does not go through RATIS, as mentioned earlier, all pipeline changes, on container changes, all certif new certificates are created that is goes through Rattis and of course the block manager. So a block deletion also works in a very similar way, like you would allocate a block. So when you want to delete a file, you're going to talk to the OM. The OM is going to say, okay, let me remove the reference of that file from my metadata, but I'll lazily delete it. So I'll uh, so the OM has a sync process which slowly pushes these deletes onto the SCM and the SCM pushes these delete on, uh, deletes onto the data node and it works with the data node to make sure the commands are executed correctly. So those are also state changes because they are, uh, eventually affect the containers within uh, within these uh, data nodes. So those have to go through RATIS as well. So one concept that is introduced in the SCM HA, which is not there in the OM HA, is the concept of a primordial SCM. So a primordial SCM is more like a uh, genesis SCM or like a first SCM that is you use to start the HA setup. And the other SCMs are bootstrapped from that. So uh, the primordial SCM acts as the root CA, while there's a sub CA present in all the three SCMs. And they and only when you have one root CA already present, you can have the other SCMs bootstrap from that. So this is a concept which is only used at the init level. It has nothing to do with Rattus leadership because uh, during the life cycle of an SCM HA mode, uh, the leadership could change based on so many different factors. It does, it's not like a rule that the primordial node has to be the leader. Any other node can also be the leader. And uh, 
that is more like the state machine based uh, that's completely controlled by how ratis or raft behaves other than the primordial uh, cm at all so uh, there is the, the next talk where uh, where uh, Bharat and Shah, you are going to go towards uh, go, go through the SCM security and SCM HA in detail. You'll have a lot more information on this. So I'm just going to hold off on that. Uh, we can go to the next slide. OK, so uh, the last feature that I wanted to concentrate on is the non-rolling upgrades. So as we see more adoption from the community, there's one feature which we want to concentrate on, which is to make sure that the upgrades are clean. So the easier of that is to go with like a non-rolling or an express upgrade. And uh, that was part of the 120 release. And uh, the, if, if you look at the implementation of the non-rolling upgrades, there were a lot of concepts borrowed from HDFS. So we have a concept of finalization where we expect the user of the cluster to give us a thumbs up to say, OK, I'm OK with the upgrade. Go ahead and do the final actions that you need to do. And then there's a concept of layout feature, uh, which is extended from HDFS, but it's given a little bit more richer semantics in Ozone Manager. So any change that is brought in that is going to change the on-disk layout in an incompatible way can qualify as a layout feature. So SEMHA itself is a layout feature. The FSO optimization itself is a layout feature. So if you start using FSO layout and if you start writing data into that, you cannot go back without losing access to the data. So that is like a clear candidate for a layout feature. So uh, since we have two master components here, the OM and SCM, so the layout feature version hierarchy is separated out, and the finalization also is separated out across the OM and the SCM. Right now, there is no incompatibility between the OM and SCM, but in the future, if there is, there is there are some releases where they, they become incompatible, we might have to come up with a matrix to kind of support that. So that is still in the works. And uh, just like HDFS, we have every component which writes down its layout version onto the disk either inside the version file or inside the rocks DB that it maintains. In the case of a data node, it has like thousands of rocks DB. So there's, it puts it into the version file, but the other two, uh, the other two components, we, we prefer rocks DB also to have it other than the version file. Uh, and uh, the finalization from the user's perspective will be done on the OM and the SCM. And the data nodes will pick up the finalization request through the SCM from the, in the next heartbeat. So, what you do is when you finalize the SCM, the SCM comes to a clean state where it stops all the current jobs that it's running in terms of the node management. It moves itself to a higher version, and then it says, any data node who's talking to me after that, you also need to move to my state. So the system does not make uh, progress on writes until we have at least a, like a, a subsection of data nodes which have actually gone to the finalized new version. And I talked about version here, it's mainly on the layout feature version. It's not the actual software version. And uh, there were some interesting uh, implementation choices that we use for this. So uh, we wanted to separate out uh, the functional stuff with the core stuff uh, away from the code that we add for the upgrade. So we use aspect-oriented programming with annotation-based approach where every layout feature can provide specific actions to be run on specific phases of execution. So you could, you could run an action on pre-finalized, you could run an action on finalize, and then in the future, we might add an action on downgrades as well. So that gives uh, like a layout feature developer a lot more uh, uh, you know, ease of use and e ease of writing code outside the actual main code that exists. Uh, yeah, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, we have seven minutes. Let's try to speed up and leave some time for Q&A. Sure, yeah. Sorry. So just a, a couple of slides more. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, one other uh, implementation that we did for the non-rolling upgrades was on the Ozone Manager side, which is called the OM preparation. Uh, the OM preparation is, is quite simple. So we have a concept of uh, a raft log where every operation that comes inside the Ozone Manager is put inside the raft log. And every, uh, the follower Ozone Managers take that operation and then they try to execute it. So if there's a slow follower in your system and when you're trying to do an upgrade, and let's say we have changed the code which actually handles that uh, uh, processing of that log entry, then it is it is possible that your slow follower applies the transaction or executes the transaction after the upgrade, which means it's going to use a different version of the code to actually execute that, which could mean that the DBs could diverge or the OM could crash or we don't really control 
what kind of uh, permutations are possible there. So to avoid this, we, we introduce the concept of OM preparation, which is a command that you execute on the OM, which is going to clean up the OM in terms of uh, the existing transactions that are there in the system. It's going to apply all the transactions and all the OMs that are up and running. It's going to make sure that there are no more logs that you can that you that you would reapply or apply after you start up and you go to the new version of the code in a very clean state so it's a, and if if you uh, and during uh, after the om is prepared you cannot write any data to it because that's going to create new log entries uh, if you if you want to go ahead with the upgrade you can finish the upgrade and start with the upgrade flag if you don't want to do the upgrade you can always do a cancel prepare and stay on the same version so, uh, yeah that's it on the om preparation side I think we can go on to the next slide. OK, so a quick look at the roadmap. So uh, these are the features that are we are currently working on for the next few releases. Uh, the big ticket, the erasure, uh, big, big ticket item, which is the erasure coding, which is fastly being developed right now. We should get it in time in the next like few months. Uh, another interesting piece is to improve the performance between the S3 gateway and the Ozone Manager. Right now, we use uh, a connection per request, we would rather want to have persistent connection and just flip out the user context there. Uh, and then we have the streaming write pipeline, which is like a sub product of the rapid streaming effort that went in. So this is to achieve zero copying semantics when you want to uh, write data onto the stream of the Rattis pipeline. And then when, when the data nodes pick it up, you don't want to keep copying from the buffers of the gRPC to your internal buffers. So that when you write to the netty, uh, stream directly, you, uh, it provides a mechanism to directly read the data using offsets rather than copy it. We have the container balancer, which is useful when you want to add new nodes into the ozone cluster so that the balance of containers, the utilization of space within the data nodes is, is somewhat constant. And then we have the multi-tenancy support in the S3 interface. Uh, as said earlier, right now we only support uh, one volume for the S3-based access, which is the S3V. In the future, we want to add something uh, more richer semantics around usage of the S3 protocol, where you can you can create tenants within the ozone ecosystem. The users are either Kerberos or LDAP, and you can associate a set of users into tenant, and they will be assigned a volume, and you can use your authorizer to kind of manage access to that specific tenant. So that's a big piece that's coming in. Uh, we also added like a usability uh, feature on Recon, where we show summaries at the volume bucket directory level for uh, the prefix optimized buckets. So, and which, which brings us to the last one, which is the uh, bucket level layout that I was talking about. So, so right now uh, in 110, at least uh, you could only set the layout at the ozone manager level, but in the future you can set it at the bucket level. You can have a bucket which is optimized for just prefixes or like OFS based access. And then you could have a bucket which is only uh, uh, Optimize for object store where you don't create these indi individual paths. You expect more like a get and put kind of semantics there. So that gives us a clear separation of how you want to use ozone. You don't, you don't need an absolutely new deployment if you want a new use case. You could operate it you know well within the various volumes and buckets. So that is uh, it's being finished up. So we should see that soon. Yep. Um. So. I, I hope you all have enjoyed this talk and do join us for um, a few other talks related to ozone um, in the rest of the Apache con. Um, if you would like to contribute uh, in terms of documentation, um, features, bug fixes, suggestions, anything, you are uh, more than welcome to join us on the Apache Jira. And uh, if you have any just general developer questions, you can definitely email uh, on the mailing list. Uh, we've listed some external references here, uh, like the uh, our Ozone Apache website. And then uh, we have the Cloudera blog, uh, which filters all the Ozone blogs. So there are quite a few blogs about uh, benchmarking uh, Hive on Ozone versus Hive on HDFS, um, billion keys, and uh, how the multi-raft improves the performance of writes, uh, etc. So now let's uh, jump over and take some questions, Arvind, and we do have a good number of questions. So first one is from Benjamin. Uh, for a single node deployment like a POC, is there a way to configure Ozone to use no replication? Uh, yes, I guess we do have that option, right? We can oh. set the replication by default as one. Well. 
Yes, so uh, you would probably use the reduced redundancy uh, header if, if S3 right. is your uh, cup of tea. Uh, Correct. Or else, yeah, if it's just regular ozone client, you can set the replication to one. Right. And then if, is, I mean, if you know, don't really recommend one node, but uh, if Correct. there's just yeah, one node. DLC, so, yeah. yeah, so uh, yeah. Okay. Next you, one is, know, uh, you, you create like a single rattus ring. It, that's how it will work. It will be like a single node rattus ring. Yeah. The next one is the ozone has tier storage mm -hmm. mechanism as an HDFS. That's a good question. So uh, we are looking into that right now. So we are uh, seeing how to manage, you know, warm data versus cold data. We can support like a two way replication instead of three way EC. So that is going to come after we have finished EC, I believe. So that that is definitely in the pipeline, but we are not actively working on it right now. Right. And the next question is from Sean. Do we have a security enabled configuration for ozone Kubernetes deployment? I only found the security configuration for Docker Composer and non-security configuration for Kubernetes in the official examples. Uh, I, I don't think we have that ready, right? We might have to add it, Sean. But that's yeah. a good, good question. We'll probably add it. And one more from Sean is, will this presentation be available in YouTube afterwards? I came late. Absolutely, Sean. So please follow the um, ApacheCon channel in YouTube. Uh, it should be available in a couple of weeks' time. And uh, if you follow the chat right here, I've posted the GitHub link where we will post these slides. And but yeah, if you do have any other questions, please do not hesitate to uh, hit us up in Twitter or LinkedIn uh, anyway uh, from these slides. Well, that's it. I guess we are out of time. So thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, and look forward to uh, you know seeing you again in some of the other Ozen talks. Thanks, Arvindan. It was fun. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, folks. Thanks, folks. Bye bye. Bye bye.